Welcome back everyone. For part two of the Safari 10 data set with a convolutional neural network, we're going to focus on creating the model and then training the model. And this is going to look extremely similar to what we already did before for the MNIST data set. We're gonna focus just on the main changes that have to do with the fact that there are now three color channels. Let's get started. All right, so here we are. Now that we understand what these images actually look like, let's go ahead and create the convolutional neural network class model. We'll say convolutional network, and technically you can call it whatever you want, but the main thing is that we're going to inherit from nn.module, and then what we'll do here is say def underscore underscore init underscore underscore, and then pass in self here, and we'll I'll go ahead and instantiate the parent class nn.module by saying super dot underscore underscore init underscore underscore open and close parentheses, and then let's set up our convolutional layers and then our fully connected layers. So we'll say self dot, and the first convolutional layer, we're gonna build it using, just as we did before, con v 2 d. And we'll say, and I'll put in comment what we did before. So I'm just gonna comment previously when working with the MNIST data set, I said one, six, five, one. So basically, if we take a look again by doing shift tab here, we see the input channels, the output channels, the kernel size, and then stride. And we also have optional things like padding. What we'll do here is previously I had one input channel. That was because that was a grayscale image. But since I now have red, green, and blue channels, the input channel is three. And then the output channel, again, that's gonna be the number of filters. This is technically an arbitrary choice. So let's go ahead and choose six again. So we'll have six filters. And then if we continue on here, recall that we get to decide the kernel size, which is just one number. It can be a four by four kernel, a five by five kernel, et cetera. We'll go ahead and choose a five by five kernel. And then the other one, if we expand on this again, is a stride side. The default is one. We'll go ahead and stick with the default there. So the main change here was the fact that we're now working with three color input channels there for the convolutional layer. This was changed from the previous one. And again, you get to play around with the number of filters you want in that first convolutional layer, as well as the kernel size. Remember, the more filters you have, then the longer the training time will take. So let's go ahead and have this, and we'll say, let's create a second convolutional layer, nn conv 2 d and this one is gonna go six, 16, three, and one. So it's receiving six because we had six filters in the previous convolutional layer, 16, that is an arbitrary number of filters for my 2D convolution. And then we'll go ahead and have it be a three by three image kernel. So essentially we're going down with a stride of one. And it's kind of common to reduce the size of your kernel, but again, there's really no set rules. You can play around with these two middle values as much as you want to try to improve performance. We'll say self fully connected layer, the first one. We'll just create a linear layer here. And we're gonna say six, times six, times 16. And then the second item will be 120. So why is it six by six times 16? Well, recall that previously we had four times four times 16, and that was for the MNIST. So that was when we had 32 by 32 images with three by three filters. So what we have now with this six times six times 16 is because, and I'll actually show this in a new cell, so I'm gonna insert a cell below so I can do the math here for you. Right now, recall that we have, essentially, if we take a look at these image sizes, so remember that the shape of these images, if we have one here, let's go ahead and just grab one. We'll say images zero dot shape. It's a three by 32 by 32 image, so three color channels, each of these is 32 by 32. So what happens here is after we do some of this pooling, What's gonna end up happening is 32 minus two. So that minus two again comes from the fact that we're losing the border because of this convolution, because we didn't add any pooling. And then that is going to go into a pooling layer that's two by two. So that means we divide it by two. Then it goes through another convolution. So that's minus two because we don't have any padding. And then that's gonna go and we'll say divided by two which ends up being 6.5, but that gets rounded down to six pixels per side. So essentially we have six pixels per side here. We had those 16 filters, 
and recall that we have this six input here from those original six filters. So that's what we're getting six times six times 16. Very similar calculation to what we did with MNIST, which was four times four times 16. And I would highly encourage you to review the MNIST lecture if you're still confused on how we're actually doing this calculation. And then after this, we can, again, kind of arbitrarily decide what the next fully connected layer is going to be. So we'll say nn.linear. Let's go ahead and do 120 inputs because that has to match up with the previous layer. And we'll start reducing the number of outputs. We'll go to 84. And then let's have one last layer that's fully connected. That brings us down to the number of classes. We'll say nn.linear. And we'll say 84. And then this goes down to 10 class. Okay, so after this, we need to have our forward method. So we'll say forward self comma x. And what we're gonna do here is we'll say x, we have f dot rectified linear unit, and that has convolutional layer one, passing in that first original data. Then we take the output of that and we're gonna pass it through a pooling layer. So we'll say x is equal to f dot, we'll do max pooling, max pool 2d, and we'll say x, and we'll go ahead and do a two by two kernel with a stride of two. And then we'll say x is equal to f dot, whoops, capital F. Go ahead and do rectified linear unit and then do self convolution two, pass in x. And after that, we'll go ahead and pass that through a pulling layer. In fact, that's gonna look exactly the same. So I can just copy and paste this result right here. So copy and paste that. And then what we're going to do here is we need to begin flattening this out. So we'll say x is equal to x dot view. And we'll go negative one first. So we retain the same batch size. And then we'll say six times six times 16. And then we say x is equal to f dot rectified linear unit. And we're passing it through those fully connected layers at the end. So self fully connected one, passing the x there. And then x is equal to f dot rectified linear unit on self fc2 on x. And then here we'll say x is equal to, and we'll pass it in self dot fully connected three x. And the last thing we need to do is we'll return this being passed through the logarithmic softmax function in order to actually get it to be a class output, essentially a probability per class output, just as we did before, where we say dimension along one. Okay. So this pretty much looks almost exactly like the previous MNIST convolutional neural network. We just went ahead and edited some of the values uh, for the actual layers themselves because of those additional color channels. So if you're able to understand the MNIST convolutional neural network, this one's pretty much the exact same thing. We just have to take uh, care careful note of the fact that there's color inputs here. So let's go ahead and run this. I'm gonna delete that little calculation we did here. And let's create our network. We're gonna set it up with the same seed. So we'll say torch manual seed, that way you get the same random initializations I do. I'll just arbitrarily choose 101. Let's create an instance of that convolutional neural network and ask for the model back. We get it back. So if you get any error here, go ahead and just copy and paste this from our notes. It means you made a typo somewhere. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and check the parameters. So I'll say for param in model dot parameters, go ahead and print param, and then we'll say dot number of elements. So we go ahead and run that and whoops, I just wrote param, not param. Let's go ahead and fix that. There we go. So here we see the number of elements and if you actually sum these all up, that's equal to 81,302. So even this uh, network here that's dealing with color images, is still less complicated parameter-wise than our initial artificial neural network that was dealing with the MNIST data set. You can imagine the difficulty for a fully connected layer with no convolutions or pooling layers to have to deal with such large amounts of data when already with even just grayscale images, we were having to worry about parameters in hundreds of thousands. Here with the convolutions for even color images, we're still haven't even reached 100,000 here. Okay, then we'll go ahead and define the loss function and optimizer. So I'm going to create some criterion here and n dot cross entropy loss, just as we did before. And the optimizer, we'll go ahead and say torch dot optim atom. 
and say pass in the model parameters and then say a learning rate of 0 0.001. Okay, so we have that already. Let's go ahead and train the model. And the training of the model is actually going to be the exact same code we used in the MNIST data set. So I will go ahead and copy this from our notebook since we've pretty much already gone through all this code. I'll quickly go over it here, but I've just copied and pasted this from the notebook. But again, what we're doing here is in order to keep track of time, we import time, set a start time, and at the very end, we calculate a difference from the current time to the start time. And then as we go through this, I'm gonna zoom out just so we can get a big picture here. We go ahead and set trackers for training loss and test loss, as well as number of correct during training and test. I'll go ahead and run this for 10 epochs. For each epoch, I'm gonna keep trackers for train correct and test correct per the batch. So we run our training batches here, and then we apply the model, essentially get the prediction by passing in features into the model, calculate the loss in the prediction, tally the number of correct predictions, update those parameters, print the results here, and looks like this is uh, being modded by 1,000. You can always edit that if you want uh, more print statements as during as you're training. And then for the test batches, just as we did before, we run it through torch.nograd so we don't update the gradient. And then um, this is pretty much all the exact same code that we saw last time. So let's go ahead and run this. And I'm going to run this and then come back once it's done training. If while you're running this, you get some sort of error or you see that it's uh, taking a really long time to print out that first epoch or first batch, um, go ahead and double check and run our notebook. The very first epoch um, shouldn't take more than, let's say, a couple of minutes, depending on how fast your computer is. But you can already see here, uh, even during this first epoch, we're getting uh, accuracy improvements. So I'll come back to this once it's done training. I'll see you then. All right, so here I am after it's done training. Mine took 509 seconds, so yours may take longer depending on how fast the hardware on your computer is. You'll notice that after 10 epochs, we're getting about 65.9% accuracy. So we're performing worse on this data set than we did on the MNIST data set. But hopefully you can keep in mind that this is a much harder data set. It has color, but also the images um, can appear widely differently. Um, so for example, here we see an image of a plane or a cat or a dog. Um, one image to the next of one cat to the other are gonna be very, very different. And we're also dealing with very low resolution images. So it may not be clear what the distinguishing factors are between these. But keep in mind, a random guess would only give yourself a 10% chance. So we're performing much better than a random guess. You should also keep in mind that some of these categories are very similar to each other, such as a truck versus a car. Let's go ahead and see and plot the loss and accuracy comparisons. But before we do that, if you've ever trained for a really long time, it's usually a good idea to actually save your model. So one way you could do this is by saying torch.save and then grabbing your model's state dictionary as we previously discussed. And then go ahead and you can either provide the full file path or if you wanna save it here in this particular location, you can say something like my model.pt and then go ahead and run that. Okay, let's go ahead and plot out the loss and accuracy comparisons. And since we're familiar with this code, I'm just going to be copying and pasting this from the actual lecture notebook because it's the exact same code we use during the MNIST lectures. So here I can see my loss at the end of each epoch. So based off this image, it probably would have been a good idea to train for a couple more epochs so we could get a general trend or flattening out. It looks like um, the training and validation loss was still a little bit noisy here, and maybe a couple more epochs we would have started to see a clearer trend. However, it really depends on how long you are willing to wait for this training time and how important that is to you. For kind of a toy data set like this one, it's not a big deal, so we'll go ahead and just run it at those 10 epochs. Let's go ahead and see the accuracy at the end of each epoch, which might give us a similar story. We'll go ahead and copy and paste this from the lecture notebook. Same code as we did in the MNIST data set. And here we can see that our training accuracy is maybe starting to flat out at 65%. Our validation accuracy is still slightly increasing. Again, maybe training for maybe two or three more epochs, we would have seen a clear trend of flattening out or uh, an increase here. But it looks like we're starting to hit the best that what this network could do. If we maybe wanted to improve the network, we could add in more filters to our convolutional layer, or maybe add more neurons to the fully connected layer. And then if we want to evaluate the test data, um, we can just print the test correct. So recall if we just say print test correct here, this would contain the results of all 10 epochs. So 
epoch 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. If we only wanted to print the most recent epoch, what we would do is say test correct and just grab the last item here. So that's how many we got correct, but if we want to actually get this in terms of percentage, we would grab the item off of this, which is just 6118. So we'll say this is number correct. And then off that number correct, we can go ahead and times that by 100 to get this as a percentage and divide it by the size of that batch, which was the test batch of 10,000 images. So we run that and we get 61.18%. Okay, again, not as impressive as the MNIST data set, which was in the kind of high 90s, but this is much better than the 10% random chance. Now there's also different ways you can display the confusion matrix. So we have a little snippet of code that you can copy and paste here, which actually displays the confusion matrix using matplotlib and a library called uh, Seaborn for you. So if you scroll back up to the top, when we did all our imports, we actually imported a library Seaborn as SN, which if you're familiar with it, it's a data visualization library, which will allow us to print out this heat map. So I'm gonna copy and paste this code. Um, this code is exactly the same thing we did during the MNIST data set. And this code is basically just for visualizing the confusion matrix. So if we wanted to, we could just print out the confusion matrix, but this is a nice little snippet of code that you can use to visualize it. So go ahead and run that. Basically it's gonna pass in all the test data set. So here we see this heat map. Over on the y-axis, we have the true label and ground truth, truck, ship, horse, etc. And then on the x-axis, we have the actual prediction. So you'll notice this kind of darker line along the diagonal, and hopefully you'd want this diagonal darker because that means it's doing a correct prediction. So if we look at the very bottom right, we have truck 807, and the truth was also truck. So let's go ahead and take a look at, for instance, truck along this column, and what it's being misclassified the most as. We can see here a little bit of a darker color with 249, and it looks like trucks are sometimes often being misclassified as cars, which makes sense. Trucks and cars could look pretty similar, especially for such a low resolution image. So that's an interesting thing here. And if we look at dog, it looks like dog is often getting mixed up for cat, which kind of makes sense. They're both kind of these uh, smaller pet furry mammals, and especially with such low resolution images, we may get some mistakes there. So. Uh, we can explore this and see which categories are being misclassified. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. I hope you found it useful, and you can see just how similar the process was to the MNIST data set. As your data sets get more complex, the training time is going to take longer. Notice this one took a lot longer than what we did on the MNIST, and if you get larger and larger images, you will probably have to create larger and larger networks. So it wouldn't be unusual to create larger convolutional neural networks. And we're gonna now, in the very next series of lectures, deal with real image files. We've so far dealt with kind of these toy data sets that are very common to use, MNIST and Safari 10. Let's go ahead and show you how to deal with real images, JPEG images or PNG images that you have saved on your computer. So we'll go ahead and work with real images of cats and dogs and see how we can build a more complex convolutional neural network to read in that image data, distort the images, as we'll discuss later on that's necessary, and then we will feed those images into the actual convolutional neural network. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture.